was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and he was telling me a story about he was up at night, like around 2 o'clock in the morning, which is unusual for him. He's usually a person who is uh, early to bed. And um, he was up till late that night, and for whatever reason, he was sitting in his office at home, and he just felt uh, uh, a remembrance came to him about a person that he hadn't seen for, I think he said, eight or ten years. It's like the, the Lord just kind of put this man upon his heart, and he began to pray for him. And then he felt like this, maybe a, a word from the Lord to call this guy. And he thought, man, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you know. I don't even know if I still have his phone number or if it's still the same number. But he started looking, looking in his information. He found the guy's phone number, and he decided to call him. And he said he called this guy up, and, you know, like I say, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. The guy answers his phone. And uh, he was sort of surprised to hear from this man. He started telling me, you know, I was up here tonight praying, and, and the Lord just put you on my heart. And I, I felt like he wanted me to call you. And the guy said, you know, I just walked into my bedroom with a gun. I was ready to kill myself. And the guy just began to talk with him and, you know, basically talked him away from the edge and... Um, the weird thing about it was he, the guy told him, he said, you know what, my phone doesn't even work. I don't even have a, a landline, but this phone rang tonight. And that was, I was thinking, wow, well, that's amazing how the Lord can do that, isn't it? <clears throat> how many would love to have a testimony like that? Well, God wants to use us. You know? It's just being able to hear him, listen. It says in the book of Ephesians that he has prepared in advance things for us to do. And they're always amazing. The things that God does are amazing. It's just a matter of us being able to listen and to hear his voice and then to respond. I want to talk to you today about uh, a scripture in Genesis 28. If you want to turn over there real quick. I don't know if you remember the story. Um, Jacob was known as the deceiver. That's what his name meant, Jacob. And eventually the Lord changed his name to Israel. But he basically deceived his brother and took away the birthright. His brother sold it for a bowl of stew, basically. And at this chapter, Jacob is leaving the country where he was born to go find a wife in another area. And as he's journeying, he comes to a certain place and he's tired and so he lays down to sleep at night. He finds a rock there and he puts his head down on a, for a pillow. And while he's sleeping, he has a dream. And in this dream, he sees a, a ladder that reaches from the earth all the way up into heaven. And there are angels ascending and descending on the ladder and then at the very top of the ladder, he sees the Lord. And the Lord began to speak to him and basically told him that the promises that were for Abraham and Isaac were now going to be passed on to him, that he was going to be the, the seed that would bring forth Messiah ultimately. And through him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That's an amazing story. You know, it was a dream, but it was true. It was actually the Lord that was there who was speaking. And what I want to focus on this morning is uh, verse 16. At the end of that story, it says, When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. I want to talk about that today. Surely the Lord is in this place, but I wasn't aware and I want to, my, my title of the message today is, is called God Aware. Being aware of God, of God's presence, of God's activity in your life. Being aware of God. I believe it's possible for us, even as Christians, to be like Jacob, to kind of go through life, and the Lord is right there, but we're just not aware of it. The Lord is working in my life, and I was not aware of it. There's a place in the Hebrews that says that we should 
Not be afraid to entertain strangers because in doing this, some have entertained angels unaware. And there's, in other words, there's things that can happen in the spiritual realm because we're so focused on the physical. I'm not saying uh, sin, but just the physical world around us. We sometimes don't find ourselves being aware of God, of what God is doing, what he is speaking, how he wants to work. And this is the case with Jacob here. He said, the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. I guess for the sake of this message, here's how I'm going to describe the definition for God aware. It just means to be conscious of the presence of the Lord. Be conscious of it. I mean, we say the Lord is everywhere. We believe that. But is, it, is, is that a reality that we walk in? God is here. When we come to worship, we're not just singing to a ceiling. The Lord is here. We are worshiping the King of Kings. When we go speak to somebody in the name of the Lord, we are being an ambassador for Him. And His Holy Spirit is using you. He's taking the words you're speaking and burying them in the heart of another person. God is actually working with you, or we are laboring together with him. But are we aware of it? And sometimes, maybe like my friend, you'll be sitting there at your house or maybe at work, and the Lord will just whisper into your spirit, and he'll say something, and you might not even be aware of it. Or you might think, ah, that was just me. But there's a need for us to be conscious of the presence of God. Be conscious or aware of his involvement. I'm still giving you the definition. To be conscious of the presence of the Lord, be conscious of his involvement in my life, and then being God aware will really affect my decisions. Things I say, what I do. If I'm aware of God, it will, it will affect how I, how I live. How many of you think would live a different life if Jesus, in the flesh, walked with you every day? That he just said, hey, Kirk, I'm going to hang out with you for the next week. Would it change my life? I wonder if it would change the way we speak to one another. I wonder if it would change the way we treat others. Or it would change the focus of our life. But the fact is, he is with us every day. It's just sometimes we're not aware. The Lord is in this place, and I was not aware. I I think it might even be possible to be a Christian and to go months, if not years, and not be aware of God, not be aware that God's presence is here. So that's really what I want to stir in your heart this morning. And maybe in the coming year, it could be a theme for us as, as, a, as a, a body of people. Let's be aware of God. Be aware of his presence. Be aware of his activity. Be aware of his voice. Be aware of his promptings. And then respond. If you turn over to the book of Acts chapter 4... It's a great story. Peter and John had gone up to the temple to pray in this story. And there was a man there who was lame. And he was asking for alms. And Peter and John didn't have any money. But as they walked on by, they said, hey, we don't have silver and gold. But what we do have, we will give you. They reached down, took him by the hand. And they lifted him up and they said... In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And this man, by the power of the Lord, was healed, instantly healed. A guy who had been lame all his life, sitting there every day, had no future, no hope other than to sit and ask and beg for the kindness of people to support him. Now he's up walking and leaping and dancing before the Lord. And for whatever reason, the Pharisees and the religious leaders were Offended by this, they didn't want the 
the name of Jesus to be continually spread throughout their community. So they called Peter and John into a, a meeting and said, hey, we don't want you to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And they were basically trying to shut them down and to persecute the church, to stop the message of Christ from going out there. Because when you're aware of God, when you're aware of what God can do, he begins to affect even the society. This whole town was now sort of abuzz with this word about Jesus. He's, he was crucified. He's risen. He's still alive. He's still doing the things he did when he walked on the earth. He's just doing it through people now. But listen to what happened in verse 23. They were thrown into prison, and then they were released. And it says on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Now, when they heard this, they said, let's get out the vote and put some new leaders in. Is that what your Bible said? When they heard this, they decided to raise up a rebellion. No. See, they were God aware. Somehow they knew that even in the face of this persecution and this sort of trying to clamp down on what was going on in their life, that God was involved and that God could help them and God could see the situation and that even God could hear them as they prayed about it. They were God aware. I wonder what happens to us when we face hardship. Is our first thought to be aware of God? I remember when our kids were little and they would fall down and cry and, you know, get a boo boo. Always our first response was, let's pray. It doesn't matter what it was. I guess I just got stung by a bee. Let's pray. Because we wanted them to be aware of God. We wanted them to know that God is there. God can hear you. God can answer a prayer. God can heal you. We used to tell our children when they, when they were little, the scripture that says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Why? Because we wanted them to be aware. God is there. He's everywhere. He sees and it's not just to make him like the big brother who's just look, but it's he's there, he's involved, he's very much involved in your life. He sees you, he hears you, he knows what you're going through. They, we wanted our children to be God aware, to think of him. And so when these people came at a time when they were being persecuted, their first thought was, let's pray. They were God aware. God can help us. And then they prayed this prayer, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. The word sovereign means basically that he's in control of everything. No one's greater than him. And here they were facing a, a, like a persecution from the leaders of their city, but they knew, because they knew God, that God was greater. They knew there was a sovereign who is God who was greater than any sovereignty that might be here on the earth. Greater than any judge, greater than any leader, greater than any king, greater than any president. And even though those forces were coming against them, they said, Lord, we look to you, the sovereign Lord. We're looking to the one who created heaven and earth. See, these guys were God aware. Verse 25, you spoke by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And what they're doing now is they're looking to the scripture. When you're God aware, you will be a person of prayer. <coughs> and hopefully it will be one of the first things you think about. So often, prayer is like maybe the last thing. I tried this, I tried that, I tried that. All these things are failing. I guess I'm going to come to you now, Lord. I've tried everything. Nothing's working. Please help me here. This was their first recourse because they were God aware. Even though these things were happening around them, God is involved. Lord, we look to you. So prayer. God aware people acknowledge the sovereignty of God. 
that he's greater than anything, greater than any struggle, greater than any trial, greater than any authority. He has all authority because he made everything. And then also God-aware people are focused on the Scripture. They acknowledge the Word of God. And that's what happened here in verse 25. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And here's what they were quoting. They were quoting from the book of Psalms this passage. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. You know what it says later on in that chapter? He who dwells in the heavens will laugh. So these men who were God aware were praying men. They believed that God was all powerful. But they also looked to the word of God. You will be surprised at how often God will speak to you through his scripture. Just like these guys. Something was happening in real life that's a place written hundreds of years earlier came to life for them. That's why it's important to be men and women of the Word of God, just cons consistently reading the Scripture, because you never know when the Holy Spirit will remind you of one little passage here or there, because you're God aware. <clears throat> Verse 27, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. And now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. The last thing I wanted to say about God-aware people is they seek the help of the Lord. They knew that they needed something from God to enable them to continue. They didn't want to stand in their own strength. They asked the Lord for boldness. And so I, I, these, these, these scriptures here show me like four things, which I've already mentioned. They prayed. They acknowledged the sovereignty of God. They looked to the scripture. And now they're asking God for specific help. So I encourage you, use this scripture as an example in your own life. Maybe Jot it down somewhere and stick it, or stick it in your desk so you can pull it out from time to time and remind yourself when you're going through a struggle to go to prayer, to remind yourself about how great the Lord is. He's greater than any problem you might be facing. Remind yourself that God will speak through the Scripture. He will enlighten you. He will inspire you. He will give you strength. It is like a sharp two-edged sword. It will be a light to your path. The Word of God is so, is so important and empowering in your life. And then finally, ask the Lord to help you do something. Give me boldness. Ask the Lord for strength. Ask the Lord for confidence. Ask the Lord for boldness. God wants to use every one of us. And just like these guys, there's always some kind of force that wants to come against you and say, Shut your mouth. Don't speak the name of Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus. It could be persecution, as it is in many parts of the world. But I think for us in America, most often it is, is fear. I don't want to be looked at as weird. I don't want to be, you know, pushed aside by anybody. So we lift ourselves up in the eyes of other people rather than lift up Jesus. But ask the Lord for confidence. Here's some practical ways that being God aware can help us. How about temptation in sin? How many of you know that it's a lot more difficult to enter into sin if Jesus is sitting with you? Right? I mean, it just is. Somehow we think he's not around. But if you're God aware, if you are aware of his presence, you are aware that he's walking beside you, he's actually living in you, and that temptation arises, I think it's a lot easier to say no, because I'm aware of God. I'm aware of his involvement in my life. And so there's a scripture in Genesis 39 
If you want to turn over there, it's a story of Joseph. He was um, taken as a slave in a man's house, and he was a faithful worker, and he was given more and more responsibility until eventually he became in charge of the man's house. The man, his name was Potiphar, he entrusted Joseph with everything. And Joseph came every day and he did his job. He was faithful, he worked, he did everything for the benefit of his master. But Joseph was a young man, sort of a handsome fellow, I guess. And Potiphar's wife got an eye for him. She thought, wow, there's a nice guy. I'd like to have him come and lay with me. And so she began to have these conversations with Joseph. Hey, come on over, you know. And she would try to talk him into coming into her bed. And he would, he would resist and resist and resist. And, of course, you know the story. One day she actually grabbed him and tried to pull him, pull him into her bed. And he basically let his, let his coat go and he ran away. And then she got so offended by that that she accused him of trying to rape her. And he was thrown into prison. But even in that, the Lord used him. But what was it that enabled this young man to be able to resist such a temptation like that? Well, here's what Joseph said to Potiphar's wife in verse 9 when she was seducing him. He said, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? I love that. That Joseph saw this action as a sin against God. See, he was God aware. It wasn't just that he was trying to be a faithful man. It wasn't just that he didn't want to offend his master. And maybe he, had a, maybe he did have a temptation for this woman, but he had this awareness of God, an awareness of God's presence that allowed him to say no. How could I sin against God and do this? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, this wasn't just a one-time event. Every day this woman came and tried to seduce him And it says, though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Isn't that an amazing thing? But see, it was his awareness of God and God's presence that really allowed him to have the strength to overcome that temptation. So before we move on, I would like to take a minute, just take a second here, and think about the temptations of our life. What are the areas that we struggle with that we feel like we can never get the victory over? Can we take a minute and just pray and say, Lord, in my temptation, let me be aware of your presence. You're there not only as a deterrent, but you're there to Give me strength to say no. The grace of God in our lives teaches us to say no to ungodliness. I pray for all of us, Lord, because we do struggle with temptation. It faces us every day. But just help us to be aware of you in the midst of our temptation. aware of offending you, aware of sinning against you, and give us strength to stand like Joseph did in Jesus' name. Another really good story in the Bible is found in 2 Kings <coughs> chapter 6. If you want to turn there, 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha was a prophet and there was a king from uh, Aram that was fighting against people of God. 
But it was funny because Elisha, he heard from the Lord all the movements this king was going to make. If he was going to be here or there or sneak up over here. And so he would always go tell the king of Israel, hey, these guys are coming this way or they're going to be over here. See, he always knew the secrets. And the king got so angry. He said he thought there was a spy in their army. He goes, who is our spy? Who's the spy in our army that keeps telling where we're going to be? And the men told him, he says, we don't have a spy. It's this Elisha guy. God speaks to him. And he actually speaks to him the things that you say in your bedroom at night. He knows every secret. And so the king decided to go and kill Elisha. And we'll pick it up the story in 2 Kings 6. They came out and they surrounded the city where Elisha was with all the chariots, all the horsemen. And when the servant of the man of God, so Elisha was the, was the prophet and he had a servant, somebody who helped him. When the servant of the man of God, Elisha, got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And listen to what Elijah said. Don't be afraid, the prophet said. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. How could he say that? How could this man have this sort of faith and confidence? Because he was aware of God. He was aware that God was involved in his life. All that we typically see is the physical realm. We only see the soldiers surrounding us. We see the chariots surrounding us. It looks like imminent death. But Elisha came out of his tent that morning. He's probably yawning, drinking his coffee. Not a, not a worry, not a problem anywhere. Why? Because he was aware of God. And he said to his servant, there's more with us than them. And he's looking, he's counting, one, two, one, two. I see all these. There's only two of us here. But there's more with us than with them. And so Elijah prayed in verse 17, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. What does he mean, open his eyes so he may see? He, he's talking about being able to discern in the spiritual world. The guy's eyes were open. He saw in the physical, but he couldn't see what God was doing. He was not aware of God's protection. He was not aware of God's activity in the midst of that, of that trial. Elisha was. He was a God-aware man. His servant was not. And so Elisha is praying, Lord, open this man's eyes. Open his eyes so he can see. Give him some understanding of what's really happening here today. And it says there, the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. What were those? Who sent those horses and chariots of fire? Anybody have an idea? They were from the Lord. They were invisible, but they were there. The Bible speaks about a spiritual warfare that we're in, and we oftentimes don't see it. We always maybe magnify and glorify <laughs> what the devil's doing. <laughs> we fail to see what it is that the Lord's doing. Man, look, the devil's got us by the, you know, got us by the, by what? He's got us by something. We got all these guys surrounding us. We're trapped. We're snared. Open his eyes to see, Lord. Open his eyes to see what you have here. Help us to understand what you're doing, Lord. I think sometimes, just like uh, the testimony, Sue, that you gave today, you know, we go through trials in our life, and all of us face hardships and struggles. But sometimes we fail to see what God is doing. Like Joseph. You know, Joseph spent so much of his life, the prime years of his life, in jail for something he never did. Yet, look what God was doing in that. God was preparing a man who would save the children of Israel. It's just being aware of God. 
in the midst of whatever we're going through, that God is somehow there. God is going to use it. God will somehow bolster me and encourage me and strengthen me and protect me. He's there. Open my eyes to see it. Another great example. God aware people are willing to step out. The story is in 1 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 6 through 15. 1 Samuel 14. The children of Israel were under the leadership of King Saul at this time and his son Jonathan. They only had like two swords. They were fighting against the Philistines. But this guy Jonathan... He had this awareness of God. How many of you know it's difficult to look at your own situation when you have two swords and you're fighting against an army that's full of weapons to see that somehow we can get the victory here? See, instead of turning and running and saying, there's no way we can win the victory here, they were aware of God. They thought God can do something in the midst of this situation. And that's what happened with Jonathan. Jonathan came upon an outpost of the Philistines. They were up on a hill, so they were a little bit disadvantaged from a military standpoint. They had to climb a hill to get to them. But he said to his servant, his armor bearer, come and let us go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. So they thought that that if we go over there, we're not really going to rely upon our own strength or our own ability. Maybe the Lord will do something. Let's go out there and see what God will do. See, when you're at the disadvantage, when it seems like there's no way, that's the time to say that prayer. I wonder what the Lord's going to do. Be aware. So many, I think are tempted in times like this to go and crawl in a hole somewhere and cry and say, oh, no, look what's come upon us. There's no way we can win this battle. Well, if you're God aware, you're willing to stand up and step out. Maybe God will do something. You never know (laughs) until you try. Like Peter stepping out of the boat. What an amazing thing that was. You never know till you try. Wonder what the Lord will do. And so he said to the armor bearer, let's go to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. See, he was God aware. To him, even if there's only two of us, God can still win. God's able to win with many or few. It doesn't really matter because God is God. He is the sovereign one. And so he looked at all the disadvantages. They were outnumbered. Those guys had the weapons. They had very few. They were down below. The enemy was above. And yet this man, because he was aware of God and thought of God in the midst of the situation, was willing to try, to step out, to trust, to have faith. And the Lord brought a great victory that day. Um, In verse 7, the servant said, Do all that you have in your mind. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. And so Jonathan said to the armor bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. In verse 13, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Then panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was panic sent by God. Isn't that amazing? It just took two guys willing to step out, willing to see God in the situation. Yes, they they didn't deny the reality of the too few weapons, the disadvantages. 
They knew that was there. It wasn't like a mind over matter. It wasn't name it, claim it. They were saying, hey, we're in a bad place here, but God is on our side. Wonder what he'll do. And the Lord brought a great victory. They, they immediately wiped out those first 20 men, but then God brought a panic throughout the whole camp of the Philistines because two men were willing to see God and be aware of his involvement in this situation. Wonder what God will do with you. If you are aware, if you're willing to step out, if you're willing to attempt something for the Lord. Another thing is, God aware people are concerned about the next generation. In Judges chapter 2, Joshua was the leader of Israel throughout the book of Joshua. And then we go into the, what's called the book of Judges. And it kind of begins with a very sad commentary. It's found, I want to read in verse 8, Judges chapter 2, verse 8. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him. In the, in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. I can't believe that. When you read the stories of what God did for Israel, the deliverance from Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the manna for 40 years, the water out of a rock, the, all the things that God did for them, his presence on Mount Sinai, his protection in the wilderness with the, cl the cloud and the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, I mean, all these things that God did for them. And then with Joshua, the Lord said, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And they saw victory after victory. You saw the walls of Jericho come down. You saw this nation and that nation driven out and God giving them the land of promise. I mean, so many awesome things the Lord did. <laughs> but as soon as Joshua's generation died, nobody knew anything about the Lord. How could that be? Well, it happens because Joshua and his generation didn't pass it on for some reason. Somehow. It didn't go to the next generation. They enjoyed what God gave them, but then it wasn't passed on to their children or their grandchildren. I pray that you and I will be so aware of God in our life and experiencing all that that entails, that we will have stories and testimonies to tell our children about the, the Lord. That our generation who follows would know the Lord and know his deeds, and the generation that follows that would know. It's not unusual for a second or third generation to walk away from the Lord. It happens all the time. It happens throughout Christianity. It takes an effort, an extra effort, upon that first generation to pass it down. And it's just a sad thing here. After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. I don't know how, I just don't know how that happened. And it says, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and they served the Baal. So that's what happens when that generation grows up and doesn't know the Lord. Or what he did is they, they serve Baal. 
What is it about the Lord that inspires? What is it about the Lord that captures their heart? Somehow, they didn't know the Lord. They didn't know what had been done. So, I guess my, my hope is that as you become God-aware, and that becomes an area of focus in your life, pass them on. Take time to speak to a teenager. Take time to speak to a child. Speak into their heart. Speak into their life. Teach a Sunday school class. Spend time with somebody that's of a different generation. Invite a, a young person out to coffee and tell them about the good things the Lord has done in your life. I mean, do you, take time to go to another generation. We all feel safe in our generation. But t- take a leapfrog. I remember when I was a, an old man of 21, I still remember this. I was walking down in my town. Let's see, I, I, must, I must have been younger than 21. I was an old man of maybe 18. Before I, before I had gone to Alaska and gotten saved. I had graduated from high school. And of course, when you're in high school, you know, you're like one of, the, one of the guys. You know, hey, we're all in this together. I remember walking down into my town in East Liverpool, and I walked by a group of younger kids that were maybe, I don't know, junior high age. And I felt so distant. Like, I have no idea what these guys are talking about. I don't understand. And I wasn't that far away. But already, at that age, I was finding a separation. You know, and you maybe are in your 20s and you have kids and you hang around with people like that, but then you get into your 40s and you kind of hang around with those people. Then you get into your 60s and you kind of hang around with those people. But what are these generations catching the ball? And that first generation that knows the Lord can grow up with that knowledge, with that treasure, with that, you know, experience and die with it. Or they can say, Lord, help me to teach. Help me to teach this other generation. And every one of us, you know, you say, I'm not a teacher. You have knowledge of the Lord and you have a knowledge of his ways. Tell them. Ask the Lord to challenge you You say, I'm a young person. Well, then go reach out to an eight-year-old kid. If you're in your 30s, reach out to a teenager. If you're in your 60s, reach out to a toddler. Let's make sure that the generations that come after us know the Lord and His ways. Amen. I'm going to close uh, in Psalm 139. So people who are God aware are people of prayer, people who recognize God's involvement, recognize his sovereignty. People who are God aware have greater success in dealing with temptation. People who are God aware see more than just the natural, but they can see into the the spiritual and trust God for the miraculous. People who are God aware are people of faith, willing to take a risk, willing to step out. People who are God aware are concerned about the next generation. In Psalm 139, I love this chapter because it just tells me how much God is involved in my life. And maybe I was never aware of it. Psalm 139, verse 1, the director of music of David, a psalm. You have searched me, O Lord, you know me. Would you, as we read this, put your own self in this 
as you're saying these words. You know me. God knows you. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts. Isn't that amazing? God knows when you're sitting down. He knows when you get up. He knows your thoughts. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. I love that about Jesus. It says in verse 4, Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. That's amazing. Before a word is on your tongue, he already knows it. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. He's basically saying, no matter where I go, I cannot get away from the presence of God. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. I mean, go to the darkest place. I went to the, one of these caverns one time and they turned the lights out. I mean, it was so dark. I mean, you could not see a thing. But even there, it's like light to the Lord. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You created my inmost being. And not only did God create you physically, but He created the inner part. Your personality, your passions, your, I don't know, your intellect, all these things God created. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I love that picture. I just see the Lord so involved in my life that he's knitting me together inside of my mother's womb, taking care to make every part the way he wants it, choosing the right thread, the right colors, the right tension, everything. He's knitting me together. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. You know, when you were just being formed inside your mother's womb, God's eyes saw that. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Isn't that an awesome thought? As I was being knit together in my mother's womb, the Lord said, Kirk, I'm going to write your name in this book, and I'm going to give you these days. And my life is before him. Isn't that great? All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. Think about that. God's thoughts toward me or toward you outnumber the grains of sand. I don't know if any of you ever tried to count the grains of sand before. But God thinks of you more than that. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. And then this last thing Search me, God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and then lead me in the way everlasting. That's a great prayer that we can all pray. Search my heart, 
see if there's anything offensive in me, Lord, and then teach me how to overcome it. So God is aware of you very much, every detail of your life, but sometimes we're not aware of him. You know, we're like, we're like Jacob. The Lord is in this place, but I was not aware. And my hope is that our eyes and ears would be open to that, to understand that God is here, his presence is here, his power is here, his anointing is here, his love is here, his forgiveness is here. Everything about him is here, and may we be aware of it. May we be aware of his voice when he speaks. May we, may we be like Jonathan and his armor bearer who are willing to step out and trust the Lord. May we be like Joseph who is able to fight against a strong temptation because we don't want to offend the Lord because he is with us. I mean, God's aware, the awareness of God's presence is so powerful in our lives. I pray that it would affect us all for the coming year. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we set a course for a new year, help us to live with this understanding of your presence. I know it will be different for each of us, Lord, how that impacts our life. We saw some examples in the scripture today of people whose lives were affected because they were understanding you. They were understanding you at the time of a trial, at the time of of a hardship at the time of a temptation. And you brought them through, Lord. Make us aware of your presence. Give us a heart for prayer. Give us a heart for time in your word. Give us ears to hear that you might guide us and direct us by your spirit, Lord. And let us always be mindful of how much you think of us, how well you know us, Lord, help us to know you in the same way. I ask in Jesus' name that everybody said, amen.